Good morning. I'm going to make a start now with my presentation. My name is Ian McNaught. I'm uh, the Head of Library and Computing Services at Majan University College in Muscat, just over the border. Now, I moved to Muscat around uh, seven years ago. And as part of the process of moving to Muscat and getting the job there, getting the work visa, I had to go through a process which I'm sure many of you have done the same, and that was of getting uh, my university certificate notarised. I had to contact a solicitor, I had to send them my certificates, they had to call the university, they had to check the authenticity of the certificate. Uh, I then had to take this stamped certificate, I had to send it to the uh, Foreign Office to get them to attest it. And this whole process, this is the email I got from the solicitor, it was a yeah, reasonably costly process and it took over a week to get it done and not all that efficient. Now I'll return to that story just a little bit later in my presentation because what I want to speak about today is the blockchain. Uh, this may or may not be familiar to you, this term, but by the end of the presentation it will be certainly a lot more familiar to you. And uh, you're hearing about it more and more and the question is, the question I'm going to talk about today is, is it actually a revolution? Is it something that's going to really change things and fundamentally change how we operate as society, which is what some people seem to say? Or is it just a whole load of hype? And uh, we're all familiar with uh, Gartner's hype cycle. I'm sure we've seen that. They do this every year. And um, they put it in 2017. Blockchain is just coming down the crest of the peak of inflated expectation and about to plunge into the trough of disillusionment, which is uh, very encouraging. <laughs> um, but I think they're actually right. I think you are hearing these days so much about it. Yeah, let's put everything on the blockchain. Let's have uh, all of our computer systems, let's decentralize them and have them on the blockchain and stuff. And we have to think carefully about whether this is actually a good idea or not. And uh, Torsten Zub, who is the blockchain uh, lead from SAP, he says, usually as technologists, we need to convince customers to use new technologies. However, in some cases with blockchain, our teams sometimes have to convince customers that they don't have a business case for blockchain. Some people are following the hype or their manager's instructions to find a blockchain case without careful reasoning about why it might be important to their company or not. Uh, another person, Isabella Kaminska from the Financial Times, she says, the blockchain is a propaganda tool most of all, a marketing gimmick to imply innovation. Now it should be noted she is a, a blockchain critic and quite sceptical about the technology, but she has a point there, as does the other one who is more of an enthusiast at blockchain. Sometimes these things can just get all caught up in hype and we use them as like a badge of innovation to say, look, we have blockchain, we're innovative, even though maybe you haven't really thought through why we're using it and whether actually you have a business case for it or what you're doing with it even makes sense at all. So very briefly, what is the blockchain? I'm going to be very brief and very non-technical. So I could, you know, it, it would take all day to really get into it, but what is it? It is the secret source that makes cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin, possible. If you have some kind of digital currency, you need some kind of digital ledger in order to record who owns what. And if one person gives some currency to another person, that change of ownership needs to be reliably recorded. Now, pre-blockchain, the only option there would be to have a centralised ledger, have one organisation or company or bank or government or whatever that is recording all of this and controlling all of this and you'd have to have a great deal of trust in that central organisation uh, in order to you know, trust them to look after the currency that you have. What blockchain does is it creates something that is distributed, it's immutable and it is trustless. By distributed, what it means is this electronic ledger is everywhere. Exact copies of this ledger are all over the place in thousands of different places in what are called nodes. And any of you today could go home and you could download the Bitcoin software and you could run a Bitcoin node. There's no, no barrier to entry there. You just need a bit of technology just to set it up. But you can do that. You can become part of this system. 
And so that means no government can control it, no organisation can control it, no hacker can feasibly hack it because they'd have to hack every single node simultaneously. So it makes it very secure and this is what's meant by distributed. It completely breaks away from the centralised model. Immutable means that once something is committed to the blockchain, it is there. It cannot be changed. There's no going back and editing it. And you can see in the case of financial transactions why that's important. If person A gives some money to person B and then has second thoughts, they shouldn't be able to then go and just edit it so that that kind of never happened. What, of course, would happen in a scenario like that is they would have to discuss with person B and say why they want some money back. And if they come to an agreement, person B would post a second transaction, posting some of that money back to person A. But the original transaction is still there and has never changed. Trustless, it means you don't have to trust the people you are interacting with, the, the other parties. You don't have to trust a central organization. Effectively, you don't even need to trust the blockchain. You need to trust, all you really need to trust when it comes down to it, is maths. Because through some very clever cryptographic uh, algorithms, blockchain can prove that things are valid. It can prove mathematically that things have not changed. <laughs> so this creates something that uh, creates this underlying platform that can do some really smart stuff. But the question is, we're at an education conference, not a finance conference, so why on earth am I talking about all of this? The key point here is that blockchain is not a digital currency. Digital currency is an application on top of blockchain. And you can basically create any kinds of uh, applications on top of this underlying platform that is known as blockchain. So I want to just explore a few possibilities, and this is all in the imaginary uh, world at the moment, but just to get you a bit excited about what is possible with blockchain, and secondly, to think a bit uh, critically and realistically about what things should go there and what things maybe shouldn't go there. So let's just revisit the story I told at the beginning about notarising my certificate. What if after I graduated, I went to my university and we used my personal private key combined with the university's private key and we posted my certificate to a public blockchain but encrypted with our keys onto this public blockchain. Then what happens when I need to prove my certificate to another party is I give them the transaction ID of the transaction where this was placed there, I give them my public key and then they go to the university's website to download the university's public key so they know it comes from the university and it's not one that I have faked. They can then prove 100% when they put that into their software that this is valid and that the university agrees with what I'm claiming. This is 100% verification, which even in the case of my notarised certificate, all it's really doing is putting another layer of document with questionable authenticity, because with a bit of Photoshop, you can do a lot of things. Whereas in this case, it will be 100% uh, proven and it benefits everybody. It will be simple, it will be quick, it would be maybe there would be a small transaction fee, but nothing like what I had to pay uh, to get my thing done. So it benefits everybody except maybe the solicitor, but never mind. Now, a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about. Um, the guy this morning, Grant Lickman, he was talking about uh, how things, the relationship between the producers and the consumers is fundamentally changing today. And uh, a couple of things that I've heard talked about for years now, uh, but have never really gained a huge amount of traction, is open educational resources and open access journals. We see a bit of movement with the open access journals, but still it's only 10% of all journals that are out there. And both of these things, what they're effectively trying to do is decentralise the access to knowledge and to move away from a centralised uh, model where there are uh, gatekeepers, big commercial companies that are gatekeepers that charge you money before you get to it. But one of the problems with them actually gaining uh, traction is when you do have a central profit-making organisation, it makes it all very simple to make it sustainable. You can make a simple economic model. When you move away from that, 
it gets very difficult. And you can see over the decades there have been all kinds of arguments and debates about how open access journals should be funded. There's all kinds of different ideas, some of them better than others. But it's a constant challenge. Now let's just imagine we moved into more of a blockchain model. Let's imagine we had a system where you could post your open educational resource to a system that would then get community rated by people in terms of the quality and the accuracy of what you're putting out there, because that's a problem with OERs, knowing how good it is. And maybe the rating, uh, who's rating it, is weighted based on their contribution. So it's all algorithmically comes together with this rating. And then this rating can form a price that is paid for by tokens on the blockchain. So yes, there would be some kind of cost, but as you earn money or earn tokens based on people using your resource, you have that balance of tokens which you can then go and you can spend to get other well-rated open educational resources. So you start building this self-sustaining economic ecosystem. If you don't want to participate but you just want to get stuff out of it, well you can buy some tokens. If you're a school and you want to get access to it, you can buy some tokens using your own currency and you can get access to this. With open access journals, what if you had a similar system like I described, but the rating could include things like the number of citations. If you've got a paper that has a huge number of citations, that has some kind of uh, a measure of its value and so then the price goes up. Uh, if it's pe peer reviewed, then maybe that adds to the value. And as you are publishing to this blockchain, you're receiving tokens which you then use in your research and you put back into the economy. So there are all these kind of things that could be possible and, and it makes the facilitation of a decentralized uh, access to knowledge uh, very different and, and much more possible in a way that really we've struggled to do so far. Now, like I said, this is all imaginary, but I think that this shows some directions that maybe we can go as educators. But as I said, there is also a lot of hype, and you know, the blockchain is not just a complete replacement for relational databases or for virtual learning environments or for any of the other things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. There are some things it does really well that you can't do any other way, but there's other things that are not so good. And so what I want to just present, and I'm short on time, so I am going to be going through it very quickly, but if you're interested in this, you can find it on my Twitter account and on LinkedIn, uh, which you'll see at the end. But this is basically a decision tree, looking at, should I build it on a blockchain? So if you have some kind of idea, um, this is something you can run through, and it will ask different questions about the nature of your thing, and does it fit in? with the way that blockchain actually works. And this is to try and guide us into things that actually make sense to do this way. So there are seven fundamental questions here which I will very quickly go through. First one is, is there already a central authority that is providing this service? And if there isn't, could it be possible in a centralised way? And if it could be possible or it already is done that way, is there a problem with doing it centralised? Because blockchain is all about decentralising. If that's not a key objective of what you're doing, then it's not going to be a very efficient way of doing what you're doing. And you probably want to think of a different thing. Next question is, does your application work on small transactional object, data objects? Um, Blockchain is not suitable just to replace a relational database or replace a massive file store. So if you have you know, big media files and things like that, you can't literally store that in the blockchain. Now there are some innovations which I mentioned there, the IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system. I'm not even joking. Uh, and that is a file system based around blockchain technology. So there are some ways that this is changing a bit, but you have to think about how uh, blockchain actually stores data and what kind of data it stores to make sure that there's a fit there. Next question is, do the users of your application require an ultra high level of security and confidence in the data that they're accessing? Of course we all want good security and confidence, but with blockchain, because of the level of it and the decentralised nature, this comes at a cost. So is it worth the cost uh, of 
um, giving that level of security and confidence. Does your application facilitate the sharing of data between multiple parties? If it doesn't, then you really don't need blockchain. You need some kind of centralized data database. If it's just for your institution or your network of institutions, you probably don't need blockchain. But if there are lots of parties in the mix, then you probably do. You also need to consider the level of trust between these parties. Is it high? Is it medium? Is it low? If it's low level of trust with lots of parties, then you definitely you know, have a good case for blockchain. But if, it, if there are a small number of parties or a high level of trust, possibly you don't so much. When there is a high level of trust, like a bank or a government, sometimes there might be an argument for decentralizing, but you need to think seriously about whether or not it's worth it. And finally, and this is probably the most important one, is that does your service have an intrinsic value? Because the way the blockchain operates is it relies on people running it effectively, as I mentioned before. And they have to be compensated for that. And that works through tokens, it works through being compensated through cryptocurrency and things like that. So it's not free. It can often be a very cheap and efficient way of doing something that would have been a lot more expensive before, but you have to have an intrinsic value. If you don't have that intrinsic value, even if it would be very nice to have it on the blockchain, it's not worth putting it there. If you can answer all of these questions the right way, then yes, you probably have a good thing to put on the blockchain. So if you want to access this and have a look at it more, at Ian McNaught on Twitter, you can find it posted very recently there, or look me up on LinkedIn, email me, and uh, I'd be happy to send you a copy. I'm gonna have to finish there, that's my time up, but uh, I can have a couple more minutes. Okay, well, I did have one more slide. Um, so, just a couple of cautions. Um, blockchain is revolutionary, to answer my original question. I, I truly think it can fundamentally change the way that we interact. It can build new decentralized economies, and it can change a lot of things in education and beyond. But a couple of things that have to be thought about is the support and security of blockchain. Because of the way it is decentralized and highly secure, a huge amount of the onus for access of your data goes with the individual. So if you have cryptocurrency, if any of you have bought any, you will know that if you lose access to your wallet, if you lose effectively your private key, you've lost that. There's no bank you can go to to say, oh, I've lost my PIN number, I need assistance. If you lose it, it's gone. Doesn't matter if that was you know, a few dollars or that was hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's gone. So as we build up these decentralized things, we have to think about how that's actually going to work in reality. Because providing support in a decentralized way is a real challenge. Because yes, you could hold copies of everybody's private keys, but then is it really decentralized? They're gonna to have to trust you a huge amount. And the second thing, is the cost and complexity of it. You know, we can find people everywhere that can program a really fancy system on top of a relational database. Finding expertise on the blockchain, it's a new technology, it's very difficult. And the cost of it, as I said, some people seem to think it's free because there's not a company you pay money to. But of course, there are transaction fees. So is it actually gonna be worth your while changing from what is a central silo of data to this completely distributed thing. Maybe it is, and maybe you'll save a lot of money in terms of the efficiency, but this is something that you really need to consider. And that is the official end of my presentation. I'm sorry it's been uh, very rushed. Uh, I'm going to have to actually rush off to the higher education stream now where I'm hosting, but if you catch me around at any point, please uh, grab me if you have any questions. I'd be very happy to talk more about blockchain to you. Thank you.